morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. Thank you for joining our weekly live stream. This is a live stream we do every Tuesday at this same time, same place on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you for being here today. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients through the world with their digital transformation journeys. And our topic for discussion today is business intelligence, data, and security in digital transformation. So we're going to get into the uh, the data and analytics and security side of things. Uh, a, a fairly relatively technical topic, I suppose, maybe relatively more technical than we typically get in this live stream, but this will be a good good conversation to round out some of the other topics that we cover. And every Tuesday, we do these live streams to cover various digital transformation topics, ranging from the people, process, technology, and strategy angles of transformation. And uh, this live stream is actually part of our weekly Transformation Ground Control podcast. So you're part of the live production of our podcast. We'll edit this interview once we're done. We'll polish it. We'll add more content to it. And we'll make it part of our weekly Transformation Ground Control podcast. And this episode will actually be released a week from tomorrow. Um, so thank you for being here and helping us with the weekly recording of the podcast. Um, a couple of things before we introduce our guest. First of all, uh, like I said, we are live here today, obviously, on multiple platforms. If you have questions, please drop them in the chat at any point along the way. We'll we'll keep an eye on the chat. We'll get to your questions and uh, look forward to any questions or comments you have along the way. And secondly, if you could just drop in the chat right now, if you don't mind, what city and country you're joining from today. We'd love to hear where in the world you're joining from today. We typically get a global digital transformation community here on Tuesdays, so I always love to see where where everyone's uh, from here today. Um, our guest and I are on different continents, uh, very different parts of the world, so looking forward to seeing where all of you are from as well. And uh, last but not least, I think I already mentioned it, but if you have questions along the way, please feel free to drop them in the chat. So um, our topic again today, business intelligence, data, and security, and di digital transformation. And joining us to help us really unpack this topic a bit more uh, for discussion here today is Ghassan Kabara, uh, who's joining us from Kuwait. So Ghassan, thank you for being here today. <clears throat> thank you, Eric, uh, for having me, first of all, on your podcast. Uh, when I woke up this morning, uh, I checked uh, the LinkedIn post, your post, and I found out I was your guest. And then I looked <laughs> at the title, <laughs> and then I said to myself, my goodness, I have to catch up on the BI and governance so uh, I've been working the last six hours, you know, recapping. But, you know, before someone does an exam, you know, and you study for it, you just tend to get a brain lock. And hopefully I won't. Anyway, uh, again, uh, I guess it's better uh, late, I... late than never that you better late than never that you realize you were going to be a guest on the show here today because you're always oh, on oh. the live stream contributing, asking <laughs> yeah, questions. So you, it's probably good. You know, I, I guess I forgot to tell you that you were going to be a guest. So thank you for <laughs> thank you for rolling with it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks, Eric. OK, a bit of a bit uh, a bit of about me. I graduated from Northeastern University, Boston, a great city. Many years ago, uh, I'm an electrical engineer and moved into IT. I uh, worked in IT as a hardware engineer and then moved to the soft side of it. And because I like the term of systems analyst, I don't know, at that time uh, when I graduated, systems analyst was fun. Uh, it seemed to me, you know, when you used to conduct studies. So I worked in it with a company that does in-house software development, and my role was to go to clients and conduct their fact-finding exercises. Uh, and of course, we would be selling them systems. Uh, I also worked, I do a lot of uh, freelance jobs in my career and where I've done audits to IT departments and reviewed and evaluated their systems. That's alongside with the jobs that I have held as being an IT manager. And uh, on the ERP side, I worked uh, worked with uh, ERP systems from uh, releasing RFPs to implementing ERPs, Eric. And um, what I liked about it was the actually the 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 uh, you know implementing is great, but the business intelligence side that actually got me into it. And uh, because I was kind of a, a data junkie, I learned about this word data junkie a few weeks ago um, um, that uh, uh, a colleague of mine told me, hey, Gus, why don't you go and take the CISA exam? It's a certified in, you know, uh, um, what uh, auditors uh, certification. And I took the CISA about 20 years ago and uh, I like data and uh, I believe data speaks to me. And uh, that's why we're talking a bit today about business intelligence. Right. Well, and it's such an important topic. In addition to being an interest of yours, it, it's becoming increasingly important, in, in my opinion, just because 
data is something that organizations have accumulated over decades of having yeah. different multiple system migrations and they've sort of brought a lot of that data with them for better or for worse, you know, whether it's clean or not. And now yeah. though, it seems like they're sitting on these organizations are sitting on these large, um, you know, high value commodity types of things, which is data and the information behind it. But yet a lot of organizations still haven't figured out how to really maximize the value of, of data and BI in general, but maybe just to back up, you know, why, why do you think, first of all, what is business intelligence and why do you think it's so important to digital transformations in general? Okay. Um, okay. Great question, Eric. Uh, let me start with a little story. If you're patient before I answer this question, because maybe sure. the story will say something. Uh, many years ago, I was hired uh, to, to, to come into a company and uh, restructure their IT setup. And uh, I think it was the, the first week I was sitting in the office with the managing director and uh, someone knocks the door and uh, comes in and goes to the MD and tells him, and there's a discussion there, apparently. It was the rental manager. It was a car dealership. So the rental manager wanted to see the director urgently. So there was a discussion going on, you know, while I was sitting drinking my coffee. And then the, the, the guy left, the manager left. So I asked the managing director, what's this about? And he said, we just have one of our customers who, who rents fleet. Uh, apparently he was asking for a discount, uh, and, uh, they did not give him the discount he wanted. They gave him a partial discount. So I said, oh, great. Uh, uh anyway, uh, as I went back, I, I, I decided to do a bit of an analytics on, on this customer. And, um, and then after a week, uh, during that time, I found out that we had lost this customer who was with the company for many years because, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't get the discount he wanted, Eric. Uh, so uh, I did the. I went and I called the MD. I said I'd like to show you something. So I did a presentation. I called him in and I said, uh, "Let me just tell you something. Uh, you know, you know when you do, when you conduct, uh, you, you you know you know the Pareto analysis, Eric, where you have twenty percent of the eighty, you know, give you eighty percent of something. So I told him this customer that 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 uh, that I think we lost." Uh, was on your top 5% out of the 6,000 customers we have, he was the top 5% in terms of revenue. How on earth could you let this guy go? Because, you know, to, to, to get people to reach that stage, it's very, it, it costs a lot. So, so he said, wow, uh, I, it wasn't explained to him in that manner. Then I said, it's not over. Also, they used to come into service and they used to bring in your cars and used to get revenue out of that. And he wanted to pick up the phone and speak to the finance manager. I said, I'm not finished. And he said, is there anything else? I said, yes. Every year we tend to deflete the cars and we get revenue from reselling the, the rental cars that are defleted into used cars. So I, I showed him a big number in the last 10 years. And honest to goodness, Eric, he was dumbstruck. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is apparently the, the rental manager and at that time they did not give him the information the whole what we can say 360 degree view for him to make the decision uh, maybe he was hasty on making it maybe he didn't have enough time so this brings me onto the issue of uh, about business intelligence uh, if you have if you look at the life cycle of a decision making you know like you have two days to make a decision uh, and uh, this was valid 10 years ago maybe it's still valid now and maybe you know I hope it will improve but a lot of time is spent on gathering the information, okay? And then you have little time to make a decision. And maybe this was the case. They did not have, you know, the, you know, especially when you're getting it from different systems and you, you can't press a button and get the report. You have to go back to IT and you have to, you know, get them to run reports and get them from different systems. So that's why business intelligence, okay, uh, needs to be able to be at the fingertips of those decision makers so they can get the information and make the decision at the right time. And, uh, and you know, that, that's one. Uh, and of course, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, we, we used to have data warehouses, we still have them. And I think the whole objective of these data warehouses is to enable those, those knowledge workers to actually, uh, you know, get reports or intelligence without referring, uh, asking IT. But that story still sinks in my head. It was over 20 years ago because I really, honest to goodness, uh, when, when, when the, the, the MD saw the numbers, although he knows the customer, uh, it was, he was just completely uh, dumbstruck. I, yeah, there's, there's definite value there and definite, um, ROI if that person or in that 
example or story you told, if they had had the right information at the right time, um, you know, you, you, you have to wonder what is the ROI on that investment they could have made in, oh, in yeah. better information. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess, and I think you've already, uh, somewhat answered this, but when you think about a digital transformation, then it just an organization that's going through a transformation. A lot of times they think about, let's figure out how we can replace our old legacy systems and, and get rid of that technical debt. We think about how can we be more efficient to give people tools to make them more efficient. But a lot of times business intelligence and, and the, the, analytics behind it isn't top of mind for organizations, but why, why should it be? Or why, why is business intelligence so important to digital transformations in general? Uh, Eric, uh, at the, at the end of the day, um, uh, um, it's all about data, whether you have an ERP system or any system, you know, you're working with transactional data. Um, people are using these systems to operate, you know, to generate invoices and, 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 you know, uh, to do the operational uh, functions but at the same time all this data is eventually used for information okay i mean uh, you know data when you get information you get knowledge and and that's what it's all about so uh, in a digital transformation um a project you need to make sure that that let's say you're migrating from a from a uh, from an old system to an erp you make you want to make sure that your data is clean I, I i've seen a lot and i've heard and i've seen and been involved in a lot of cases where data was migrated to speed up the implementation and there was no thorough cleaning where the master data had suffered like you would see duplications of, of customers data or suppliers data so to get into a, an erp system coming from an, an, a legacy you need to make sure data is, is 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 absolutely clean and you know migrated now once you're in the erp you need to now start applying you know the data governance concepts which which a lot of uh, companies, I don't think they, they there is uh, they they have this uh, the the, opp the the opportunity to have a data officer, but there definitely needs to be a formal procedure, okay, to you know uh, for the organizations as the data is being inputted after post go live. Otherwise, you know, garbage in, garbage out, and and we're back to the old problem where. The MDs can't make a decision because not only could they access the data, but the data was not accurate. Right. And 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 to add in that, uh, it, it now in times of artificial intelligence, you know, you talk a lot about that, a, a lot about this topic on your podcast, and you know, it's an emerging technology. Artificial intelligence, at the end of the day, is relying on the data, Eric. Okay. Mm -hmm. You've got the machine language chunking the data, looking at the data. So can you imagine if the data that that this uh, automation AI is accessing is inaccurate. Therefore, what forecasts or what what decisions will it make on your behalf? So data is the heart, and that's the key, you know, to everything. Even as I speak to you now, our voice, our data is 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 going somewhere out. I don't know to the universe. Maybe if you go at the speed of light and catch up, you you can you know, you know, find out what you've said. <laughs> so right. so uh, it's all about the and the internet. The internet's just one one big data lake. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now I'm going to come back to that data lake concept here in, in just a moment. Um, there's actually an audience question about that that I want to get to. But uh, speaking of our audience, real quickly, um, I want to thank everyone who's joining here live um, in the discussion. Um, we have uh, Hamid from Ottawa and Canada joining here today. Thank you for being here. We have uh, someone on LinkedIn, although I don't see the name of the person, uh, from South Hadley, Massachusetts. Um, someone from Michigan on YouTube. Uh, Richard from Bonn, Germany. Thank you for being here. Um, Let's see, Montreal, Canada, Ryan from Denver, Daniel from Grand Forks, North Dakota, someone from Arizona, Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, who uh, Eduardo on YouTube is, is watching from Brazil. I, I imagine might be watching the World Cup here uh, this week as, as it's happening as, as we speak. Um, Khaled from Egypt, um, et cetera. So a couple more people from the UK. So great global audience here today and uh, really appreciate everyone here joining um, question I wanted to to get to here, um, Gasan. It, it's it's sort of uh, it's backing up to a really big picture sort of question, which I but I do li I like this question a lot, and it maybe sets the the context for for other discussion as we sort of get back maybe into the technicalities of of business intelligence and data. Um, but this is from Eduardo on YouTube, and he asks, um, could you explain what's paper about enterprise culture when we talk about data? 
and digital transformation. Uh, and the reason I, and I'm actually going to maybe reframe the question a bit, um, just to maybe clarify what I think of the questions asking. Um, but the, but I guess I want to ask about the culture when you, when you think about the culture of data and a culture of business intelligence, a, a culture of analytics and using, you know, using information that maybe you didn't have before, you know, how have you seen organizations not just put the tools in place, which is one part of the equation, but the other part of the equation is how do you build that culture that learns to make better use of business intelligence and data and analytics? What have you seen? You know, what are some of your thoughts there? All right. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, that's a tricky question, by the way. Um, uh, many years ago, um, when uh, I worked for, uh, for, for an organization and we, we had a system and we wanted to, to uh, and IT was in charge of, of doing all the reporting, we wanted to offload IT and, and, and put it in the hands of, of the end users, which is what, you know, the whole, the whole uh, point of, of getting a BI system. So we invested at that time in a, in a, in a software that was out called business objects and now it's been purchased by sap so um, uh, so i we got business objects in, into the organization eric and we created a data warehouse and uh, it, it took a lot of maintenance to create the data warehouse and and you know eventually to, to 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 extract the data from the different multiple systems that we had into the warehouse uh this was done in hope that we would give it to the end user so the end user would you know have the luxury of of actually you know running the queries in all honesty uh we suffered we suffered a lot even though they were trained uh, for some reason they would always they would always they would always come back to it and ask them to run the queries for them and uh, so we failed from that aspect now why we failed uh, I, I i really can't remember but i think it had to do with the culture you know uh, the fact it was that the company was over 50 years old they were used to um, you know, asking for IT for support and for reporting, and probably the average age of the end user was 40 or something, you know, and uh, so it, it was kind of tricky to, to, to get the, to, to push the data uh, BI tool completely to the end users, and, you know, they had to come back to us again. And, and, and another reason they would use saying, you know, the data is not in real time, you know, you need to synchronize it for us, it's one week old what have you but this is the hands-on experience that i had with with a with a business you know uh intelligence uh, right. project yeah yeah so it's a i think it's just an important reminder that you don't just put the tools in place you also have to enable people to really understand what they're doing with that information and, and what they're doing with business intelligence and also you mentioned a moment ago uh data governance too um, and maybe we could just dive into that for a moment. But but as far as uh, when you when you think about, and I know we're kind of jumping all over the place because this is such a broad topic, it's hard to have a real sequential uh, conversation about this kind of stuff. But when you think about data, uh, master data management and the governance behind data, what are some of the things that you've seen work from that perspective to ensure that you're not only, let's assume that you, the data you bring over to the new system or new systems is clean, and that's a whole nother topic which we want to get to which is i mean that's usually not the case usually the data that comes over is not clean if you don't handle the data migration right but let's assume it is clean for a moment and start with data governance how do you how do you ensure that you have that master data management and data governance in place to ensure that the data stays clean and that the information you're getting out of the business intelligence tools are actually um accurate okay uh again a quick story uh, when i was evaluating an erp system uh, i remember i did a, a site visit to a customer that had the potential ERP that we wanted to, to purchase. Uh, and uh, when, I, when I got there, it was a manufacturing company. And one of the questions I asked the, the team who had just ins that, who had purchased the, the ERP, remember we were evaluating the ERP, so we did a, a side visit, Eric. So I, I said, why did you purchase this, this ERP? And, and uh, I, I remember the CFO, he told me, uh, he said, uh, Hassan, we found that there's a feature in the CRP whereby uh, uh, the, the user can create the parts master data on the fly. And it speeds up the process of having to create the master, you know, parts catalog. And I said, that was your main reason? He said, yes. I said, oh, OK. Uh, and then, you know, we continued. Now, I wanted to follow up with him to find out what happened. 
and maybe a year down the line, I did give him a call and I said, remember, we came to your, to your office, we evaluated the system, how's it going with the ERP and your master data? And he just shook his head, okay? Uh, uh, he told me, Hassan, we were having problems with, with the part uh, catalog. A lot of users are creating non-parts. So what he thought was a good feature in the ERP and why he chose it, okay, uh, to, to speed up the process, actually backfired on him and created a lot of garbage into the system okay so again uh, that's why i believe in uh, uh, you know having master data controls and procedures in place because at the end of the day the parts catalog or the customer names or the suppliers details there has to be a formal procedure and that's got to do with data governance and it's a big topic this data go governance uh, eric but at the end of the day, um, I think uh, for it to be successful, you know, the, the, there has to be ownership by the end users. IT, uh, they're not the owners of the data. They're only the custodians of the data. There has to be transparency. Uh, there has to be buy-in by the end users and trust. And uh, you've got to standardize the procedures and processes. This is very important. As we, you know, as we embark on an ERP, it's very important to, to address this governance, who's responsible for what, and actually add the roles and responsibilities of those people responsible to, to, to input the master data and add this to their job description as well, because this is for them now and for their replacement, the new user who comes in needs to know that this is, he's gonna be accountable if you know he, he gives you a wrong parts master or, or you know, around customer number or, or what have you. So it, yeah. it's, 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 it's a very important topic, data governance, and it's really big. And, and you know, again, it starts with garbage in and garbage out, we keep saying. And, yeah. and I think you need to have continuous audit. I, as an auditor myself, I used to conduct audits and, uh, and, and I used to come up with a lot of discrepancies and always used to try and raise red flags. But there has to be a, a, a subdivision that, or, or, or a person, maybe call him the data officer or what have you, to continuously go inside and look at master data, you know, take it out, you know, look at it from different angles, uh, conduct a few pivots here and there and, 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 and make presentations. Uh, I think for the first year of the ERP implementation, saying doing this once every month is not too much, Eric. Right. Otherwise, it will just accumulate on you and then, you know, it'll be too late and the people will go. And then when you tell them, come, let's fix the data, because I've, I've heard stories where companies who wanted to build a data warehouse have spent over a, a year and a half to clean the data because they were getting bad results. And there's a lot of those story case studies online. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, I, and it seems like in today's day and age, the trends toward agile deployments and decentralized decision making and flexibility and enterprise technologies, those are all generally viewed as positives in the space. But I, I do see that as a potential problem when it comes to data management because they kind of run counter to you know a more structured centralized standardized way of of protecting this asset which is data um you know if in just maybe back up for a moment and just think through how you know the average person might corrupt data or might unintentionally create problems i mean there's a there's a thousand different ways that any organization might experience someone going in and changing a, a product master or a customer master or entering a transaction wrong. You know, they just aren't trained properly on how to enter a transaction. So therefore the data is inaccurate. So there's all these yeah. thousands or millions of different touch points through an organization that can have the potential to corrupt and undermine mm -hmm. data integrity if you don't have these these processes and audits in place. Is that something you've seen in your, your career? Oh yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah. You've touched on an important point here. Uh, you know, always in an organization you've got uh, two types of flows. Uh, actually, there's there's three flows in the supply chain. But one flow is is how the logical data is flowing in the system, and then the physical flow of how the physical you know entities are flowing. And uh, uh, sometimes I have I have seen uh, where where sometimes you know like if you're issuing a part into a service to install this part on a car, I have seen cases where the part has been installed, the car has left the service center, and still the part has not been issued. <laughs> from the right. parts inventory to the service to the job card to the to the invoices so there's always the physical flow tends to be faster than the logical flow 
and and this tells you a lot this tells you maybe uh, uh, the, the lack of understanding of, 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 you know, how to extract the data, the users could not be trained well, or maybe there are too many controls in place, you know, that are prohibiting the user to actually feed the information. But at the end of the day, the customer needs his vehicle and, and you know, we need to deliver it to him. So the, I always used to see a, a, a bucket full of a, you know, backlog of, 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 of uh, invoices or, you know, uh, cards that need to be fed into the system. And uh, it, it does happen, yeah. The objective is to, to make both these flows work in harmony and in, and in sync together. Otherwise, if one of them is leading, and normally it's the physical, then then you have a problem with the process. You need to review it. Yeah, and it, I, it gets back to the question about culture, you know, how you create that culture of, of data management and business intelligence. It's it's sort of like that question or that that thread because it's it's not something that you can set aside as its own separate work stream. You know, a lot of times people view data management as a, a technical thing that's over here on the side, and the techies are going to handle that. They're going to they're going to oh. cleanse the data. They're going to migrate it. They're going to map it. But the reality is, is everyone's touching and contributing to the data integrity or lack thereof, and everyone's yeah. contributing to the data integrity and the use of business intelligence and the ability to think like a, a, a smart organization that has access to that data. So, you know, day-to-day -day processes and sub-processes and day-to-day -day decisions and things that people do in the system is, in many cases, unintentionally uh, affecting or impacting the, the quality of the data. Um, you touched, uh, Eric, um, I think what I touched a bit on the job descriptions, um, yes, a, a lot of, uh, any, the moment you talk technology, the end users then the casual end users tend to throw everything at IT. Uh, I think uh, one of the, the 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 mistakes that we have made is, first of all, uh, digital transformation project is not an IT project, and we all know that. But uh, to 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 make it a people project, uh, the job description of all the end users that are using the ERP need to be changed and and and. These need to be shared with, with the with the end users because if you don't put that on their JD, and you know you may implement an ERP as they're working, their JD said one two three four, but now they've got additional work on the ERP that has to go into the JD and the HR have to feed it and this has to come back. And I think the more we add um, the the roles and uh, uh, um, of these users that have a key role in master data, the power users. The more we add their roles in their job description, the more you will uh, uh, minimize the risk of of having wrong data entry or people not understanding what roles they are, and you know you can hold them accountable. So it's really a people thing because you know we can train someone and then he'll go away and say, hey, it's not part of my job, uh, you know, to do this. Let IT clean the data. Then IT will come and say, hey, we're the data custodians, man. You know, it's not our job. And then, you know, right. you have meetings and then you're fighting. Then if you call a third party, then it's a disaster. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Too many, you get you get a lot of cooks in the kitchen at that point. Everyone's kind of pointing fingers at each other, not not knowing who's really responsible for the, the data integrity here. Yeah, especially uh, now in, in times of uh, um, artificial intelligence, we, we, we go we go back on that. Uh, and uh, uh, because that that needs a good sound clear data you know and data in the forms of structured data whether it's in an erp or on emails that is unstructured or even video data or even some companies actually keep recordings of of the the discussions they have online they convert that into into data so data is everywhere in the organization so so how you uh, you can make use out of that that's a big ch challenge and the reason i'm saying that because i just finished the course called google data analytics uh, a couple of months ago, I got bored. I wanted to refresh myself. It was an interesting course, and 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 takes you from the whole life cycle, uh, you know, of, of of how to look at data and the tools to use, and you know, and maybe that's what someone who wants to get into this field should 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 look into. But uh, there's a lot of cleaning that is involved, and a lot of bias that is involved. If right. you know, if 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 you don't sit and filter that out, right. Now, now you just touched on a question here from the audience. This is from Kyler, our podcast host here on LinkedIn. 
And she asked a really good question. And the, and the reason I wanted to bring this up in the context of what you just said is you were talking about recorded phone conversations, like a customer service rep whose uh, phone calls might be recorded and stored somewhere. And that's actual data that can be used in some way. Um, but it brings up the question in my mind um, that that's consistent with what Kyler is asking here, which is what are your thoughts on data lakes and interoperability? In particular, I want to focus on data lakes, the data lake part of this. But um, she asks, is that the future of master data management? So let's maybe back up a little bit and just talk about a data lake in general. What is a data lake and how is that different from like a data warehouse within the world of data management? Uh, that, that, that's a good question, Kyler. Thank you. Um, uh, to be honest, I don't know the difference, but, but you know, I would look at the Internet as one big data lake, the Internet, where right. you don't need bait to actually take data. You know, you can throw your hook into this Internet, the big data lake of Internet and take information. I'm not talking about the bad information, but I have not worked and done a lot of uh, research on data lakes. Uh, so forgive me if I can't answer that. But sure. um, but de but definitely, uh, you know, it, it, it could be um, if let me let me guess here. Maybe it's a bunch of data, you know, uh, a farm of data warehouses all together, you know, maybe forming a lake. I don't know, maybe and uh, where definitely the master data. Uh, you know, it it's, has to be clean and it has to be uh, reliable uh, because, you know, you're, you're, you're digging the information from, from this lake in order to make a decision. And right. uh, if you if you get the wrong information, you're going to make a bad decision. And at the end of the day, although the accountants say cash is king, information is king in, in, in this day and age. Right. Yeah, and I think a, a way to think about it, too, is, is um, you know, data lake is a way to capture structured and unstructured data. So you have, you know, historically, when you think of data, I think we typically think of things like what some of the things that we've talked about so far, like a product master. It's a numeric or a, a quantitative value that's assigned. It's very easy to search. It's very structured. Um, you have a customer ID or a customer master. You have a transaction like uh, Gassan bought product a b and c that's that's quantitative structured data that's very clear and easy to relatively easy to compile and aggregate but data lake would be something that's less structured like um, you mentioned uh, customer service rep phone calls that's recorded and stored somewhere that's not really structured it's not something you can search yeah. you know you, that well, has a different. quantitative value or anything like that so there's there's meaning to it if you can capture it and aggregate it Another example would be social media. You know, a lot of organizations will look at social media and try to capture the information of what people are saying about their products or what the feedback is from customers within the, the public eye. That's not your t traditional structured data, but a data lake c could capture that information and give you a tool to sort of analyze and aggregate it. And then you start getting into things like artificial intelligence, machine learning that can, that can start to learn what the patterns are within that data. So that's really what data lake is. Um, you know, is, is the use of that or the addition of that unstructured um, data as well as the structured. That, yeah, thanks for the insight, Eric. That was a great clarification for me. Well, as long as the data, the lake isn't frozen, and, <laughs> right. uh, you, you know, and data flows because, you know, data needs, you know, the big data concept where it's got the three V's. What is it? Velocity and variety. And I forgot the third one. And uh, and uh, absolutely, unstructured data is is this biggest con con uh, concern. How do organizations extract, you know, this little percentage of meaningful data from this data lake that makes sense for them to 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 make any informed decision? And I think that's where AI in, is going to come in into the picture. Um, I, I, I yet have to see, uh, you know, uh, people who analyze stock market trends for someone to come and say. You know, this stock is going to go up, purchase it, because if anyone has discovered this magic formula, then, well, if I have discovered it, I would not sell it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. If I can predict the next stock, you know, <laughs> but uh, but so be be wary from these people who say I can predict your, you know, your next stock market. And this is a great tool for, for you because AI uses historic data. There's a lot of chaos theory in the future that no one can predict. And the probability of that, that's. That's but that's another story, right? Might be a whole nother topic for another yeah. uh, a podcast interview for sure. Now, here's a question from Patricia on LinkedIn, and I, I love this question because it's it's giving me an excuse to tie this all back to change management, to organizational change management, and I'm I was just dying for a reason to do so. And Patricia just gave me a 
gave me an easy out here. And her question is, I'm hearing something interesting. All in an organization are responsible for data, and this should be clear in job descriptions. Um, and I think that's a really astute point or, or a very uh, good point as far as um, just the recognition that in order for this all to work, all the stuff we're talking about, data management and business intelligence and analytics and all that good stuff, we have to have everyone in the organization aligned and focused on it. It can't just be an IT thing like you you mentioned, Gasan. It has to be something that is baked into job roles, expectations, training, uh, the process definition, all that stuff. And that's something that oftentimes gets overlooked because we get so myopically focused on just deploying the tools without thinking about how are we going to use those tools and make sure that we're not undermining the value of the data and the BI that's that's behind it. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So let me back up maybe even further in the, um, you know, we've talked a lot about how processes can impact BI and data and, and how, um, you know, the master data governance and master data management is so important once you have the data in place. But let's back up even more and think about an organization that's just trying to get onto a new system and they realize that they're their data is cor- is corrupt or it, and maybe not corrupt, but um, it's not accurate. You know, over the years, it's, it's you know, death by a thousand paper cuts because so many people have touched and corrupted the data or done something wrong in a transaction that has, you know, created dirty data. How What are some of the high-level best practices that organizations can follow to start to migrate their data, to cleanse and migrate their data in a way that, that purifies, you know, some of the, those problems that's been created in the data over the years? Uh, okay, sometimes um, this has to do with data migration. You know, it, it, it's it's important that, that we get clean data into the ERP before we go live. Otherwise, as you said, once it's in the ERP, everyone's focused on, on, on using the system and no one, no one will take responsibility ownership to clean the data because, you know, that was a problem that was, uh, you know, foreseen earlier on. So uh, I think uh, data migration uh, uh, for ERP, it should be a project that that should be given the attention it deserves. Okay, and uh, this should be discussed earlier on, uh, really earlier on in the ERP and a dedicated team should be working on it. And uh, because at the end of the day, wherever you're getting the data, it's easy for a company that has no data to, to start from scratch on the ERP versus a company that's got data in different systems on Excels or other legacy systems to actually take the data and, and, and bring it into the ERP. Because what, what needs to be done here is you need to do have lots of iterations of data cleansing exercises, okay, before you decide this is going to be the cutoff to move into the, into, into the ERP. And uh, that you will find a lot of resistance in, in this exercise, Eric, uh, w- w- you know, because people are doing the day jobs and some of them are working on the ERP projects. And now you're coming also telling them, we need you to focus a lot on the data, on the cleansing of the data. And, uh, you know, if you find a duplication or what have you, which one should I take in? Which one should I delete? So there's a lot of back and forth going on. So I believe, uh, in all honesty, I would say a data migration project uh, or a data cleansing project should be done way before you start an ERP. Try and clean it in the legacy system if possible, mm. okay? Because once you've done 60% or 70% of that on the legacy system, then you've got 30% to worry about when you migrate. But if you're going to wait till the big bang and, and add it as a two-week or three-week project, you know, pre-ERP live, then believe me, due to the pressure that everyone is working on to meet the deadline of ERP, you'll have some people ignore ignore um, uh, this this issue. And let me give you an example. This is three examples that have happened due to this mishap. You know, when, when you have, uh, in, in finance, you have in the general ledger, you have a control account. And a control account in the general ledger controls the, the values of, of all the transactions in the subsidiary ledgers, they should match. So in a GL, you may have a, a receivables control account that should match all the receivables. Now, I have come with in three different projects when we have migrated data or have been involved to come and audit, I have noticed that the control account does not match the subsidiary ledgers. So something is wrong here. So then you have to work on a project and audit and analyze to find out what invoice is not in there you know what happened and i've seen this three times in the last 15 years 
believe it or not, due, due to this fact that data was not cleansed. Right. And that's hitting the that's hitting the balance sheet. Yeah, yeah, and it, there's a direct financial impact, impact there, and and that's you know the low hanging fruit, if you will, the the high value low hanging fruit when it comes to data. You also have all the other um, secondary or, or uh, other processes and impacts to data that aren't necessarily directly financially related, but they can certainly impact and undermine your your ability to make make good decisions. Uh, here's another question yeah. from from Kyler that that I think is really interesting, and, and it's actually one I hadn't really thought of. Um, but that is, what are some nuances of digital migration to a cloud system that organizations should consider, particularly when it relates to data? Is there anything that's unique about migrating data to the cloud when, as opposed to other, you know, on-premise systems and things of that nature? Uh, <laughs> Kyler, that's funny. Um, uh, I've only worked with one cloud system. Uh, one of the biggest nuisances I had was I could not migrate the data online in time to bring it to the cloud. I had to actually put the 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 database in a in a, in a tape and a DHL it to Amazon <laughs> for them to upload it to the cloud because the the internet bandwidth at that time it would take two three days for us to migrate the 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 gigabytes or terabytes that we had so th that's one of the problems it's, it's it's putting the data on the cloud <laughs> you know as you're you're moving to the cloud so. Uh, unless you you really have great speed and uh, you know you can figure out how to segment your data, then then you know just go to the data center and give them the the tape and let them bring it into the system. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, I can't see anything uh, any other nuisance other than that. Um, uh, but once it's on the cloud, then then you know your backing up procedures is on the cloud. Again, if you decide to bring something back down to premise as a backup, that's going to cause you another problem. Once you're on the cloud, you're on the cloud with your data, and good luck. <laughs> right. Well, and that that actually leads to another question, which I don't I don't have a good answer for this, so I, I won't blame you if you don't either, Gazan, and, and uh, maybe the audience does if you, if you or I can't answer this question. But I I do wonder more recently in recent years what happens when. Uh, I'm already in the cloud. Let's say I already figured that stuff out. I figured out how to get my data into the cloud. I'm on a on a um, a cloud or a SaaS based ERP system. Let's just say, and ten years from now, I decide, you know what? I've outgrown the system now. I want to move to another cloud system. How hard is it for me to get the data out of the cloud system that I'm using now and into another cloud system? It, in other words, is that switching cost or that barrier to moving data is that going to be higher than it was when I was on prem and I could just you know, I had, I owned the software, so I, it was easier for me to get the data in and out of there. Do you think that sure. will be an issue in the future or what, what are your thoughts there? No, I, I think it won't be, I don't think it'll be more difficult than taking it from premise to the cloud, because now I'm just thinking, uh, you know, in a physical domain where, the, where I'm on the cloud, I'm at the same level. Here I have a cloud system, here I have another cloud system. Of course, we know they're all on planet earth and nothing is flying above us. Uh, but the not thing yet. is, I think, <laughs> uh, yeah, not yet. Um, but I, but I think is these cloud service providers uh, tend to have, you know, open doors, you know, you can call them APIs or connectivities between each other to allow for such data migration activities. And as long as you can find, um, you know, good highways on the, on, on the internet to transfer, you know, some of them may have dedicated VPNs to transfer the data and what have you. I think it would be easier, what I'm trying to say, than from premise to the cloud, than moving. Of course, the only problem with that is, if you think you've taken your data from your old provider, he you ain't he ain't gonna get rid of it. If if he says he has, don't believe him. He's still got your data in some backup somewhere. Okay, uh, it, it's there forever. So uh, so that's the problem with data. And then you can make copies of it, and as you make a copy, it doesn't get worse. The same copy is equally the same as the first copy. It's you know it's not like uh, you know, a photocopy of a photocopy, eventually it, it you know, right. the quality disappears. So once you've got data on a cloud, but definitely I was reading an article the other day and, and some companies were try, trying to say, should I go multi-cloud or stay on one cloud? And they were talking about the same topic, what you're talking about and, and, and the challenges. Right. Now it, you, you sort of triggered another thread, something really important we haven't talked about so far, which actually was, uh, 
something you said, Gassan, but also a comment here from Ryan, who is part of the Third Stage team, and he posted a an article that we posted on the Third Stage site um, that's called "Is My Company's Data Safe in the Cloud?" Um, and that there's a link to that in the in the chat if you want to see that article. But it, but it begs the question of security. Um, you know, this is a this is a, this is a topic we could spend the whole hour just on this one topic. But maybe just at a summary level, what would you say some of the security considerations are when it comes to data that we should be aware of? Wow, wow, that's a, that is an interesting topic. I remember back in the days when the internet came and we had good bandwidth. I told the owner of a company, "Let's move to the cloud," and he said, "No, Gus, I want my server next to me. I don't trust those cloud providers." This was about twelve years ago. Uh, I said, "Okay, I guess you have a point." So, you know, that's why they refuse to go to premise. But when it comes to data security on the cloud or on premise, Eric, we want to talk about cyber attacks here. They're on the rise currently. OK, and as we become more digital, OK, uh, we, we're accumulating more data. OK, we're accumulating data. It's at an unbelievable rate. And this this data becomes attractive to the cyber criminals. OK, who, who want to steal the data and hold us for ransom. All right. And um, what, what's, what's annoying, we worry about data breaches and how to protect ourselves, okay, uh, from, the, um, from the bad guys, the bad actors, yet we fail, uh, let me put it in another way, there's no framework so far that says your data should be fully encrypted, mm -hmm. okay? You've got password encryption, you've got, uh, you know, some, some other type, but if, you, if I go to your database right now, I can take the data and everything is open. So what's ironic is that the hackers that attack your data, whether on the cloud or on premise, they encrypt it and then they hold you for ransom to give you the decryption key when it should be the other way around. Right. You should have your data encrypted and prevent the hackers from encrypting it further. And I think that's that's what's lacking. And, and, and these security standards, they're probably going to shoot me for this, but that's what's lacking in, in all these ISOs of security. There's a lot of focus on technology and, and you know, but there's a little focus on the people aspect and and this issue with, with, uh, with you know, getting data to be encrypted. Uh, I think because we've always had data in a resting place, okay, it, it's an easy target. I, I, I wish there would be one day where data is always on the move to make it a harder target for, for hackers to reach out where it's encrypted and it's always moving. And maybe this could be the, the introduction of the big blockchain data <laughs> concept. But, you know, as long as your data is in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, on, on a server, you've got these, these malicious actors aiming to get to your data and they find the vulnerability, they exploit it, and they've taken your data out. Although you may, back to the question, sorry, I didn't answer it in a way. Although on the cloud, you may think your data is safer and the providers will tell you it's safe and et cetera, and they have the tools. Just recently, you know, there's been a lot of uh, ransom where on Amazon's data warehouse, uh, the Red River one, or what, what I think that's what it was called. And so you still need to continue with, with old hardening the systems and what have you to protect the data. And then who you're gonna blame, Eric, okay? Uh, you know, you're getting cyber insurances these days saying they will insure you, but they're not going to negotiate. They won't get your data back. They may be paying the fee, but once the data's out, it's with the hacker. He's not giving it back to you, uh, even though he may decrypt it and, and he, you know, but he's still got the data. And even though he may promise he's deleted it. Yeah. And, yeah. And know, it's also the other piece of that, too, is, you know, everyone is or not everyone, but but in the media, you know, a lot of what we see are the big, massive cyber attacks, the outside nefarious actor that hacks a system, steals the data, or does some sort of ransomware um, initiative. And those those are big deals. Those are those are things definitely to be aware of. But I think what oftentimes flies under the radar that isn't as widely um, reported on or recognized is the fact that just your own employees are, are a security risk, not because they are necessarily going to try and steal your data or do something bad intentionally, but because their processes are affecting, you know, just like what we were talking about, data integrity, day-to-day -day processes impact data integrity, and day-to-day -day processes also affect data security. So in other words, if I, if I create, uh, if I introduce a third-party app into the 
organizational ecosystem that taps into the core central ERP system and somehow manipulates that data and uses it for something else. Right there, there's a security vulnerability there because I've introduced a third-party app that now integrates with a, another system that maybe I've locked that system down and I've tightened it up and now I've introduced another risk. Or there's a business process where I take data from the core system, I download it into a spreadsheet, I manipulate it and I slice and dice it or I, I dump it into a BI tool because I want to get some sort of business intelligence analytics report out of it. And now all of a sudden I've got you know, potentially data sitting on my local machine or in another app or, or whatever, you know, I've created these, these possibilities, all these endless possibilities of how data could be breached or security could be breached. Is that something you've seen as well as is, is sort of the employee, yeah. the unintentional employee data security risks as well? There's the unintentional employee uh, where he has not been trained enough and there have been, not, uh, he has not been, uh, you know, informed about the, the security policies on, on how to manage the data. And again, that's part of data governance. But but again, uh, the, the thing is uh, about the internal, you, you're talking about internal employees um, uh, accessing data maliciously. The hackers, the, the criminal um, uh, um, market for hackers these days, they're actually uh, inviting those employees, paying them money to give them the data. Okay, and mm -hmm. and it's become such a big market. Okay, and they're going to an employee saying, "I'll give you, you know, half a million dollars. Just put this USB on your computer network for me, and you know, and we'll take care of it." So, so they're buying those employees out. And now, in with 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 the introduction of the Great Resignation, I I tend to worry worry a lot about you know mm -hmm. people can can go and buy these hackers tools for for nothing and start running them. Okay, and this is increasing, Eric, a lot. Uh, from that perspective and uh and of course yes definitely uh the the you know um the what's it called i, I lost track of what i wanted to say here about the great resignation affecting you know the vulnerability potentially of yeah, getting yeah, because, bought. yeah. Uh, you know you're going to see less criminals on the street and they're going to be sitting at home wearing the hoodies trying to utilize those scripts because you know you just press a button and you run the script and and what have you and i and i do conduct from now and then awareness training campaigns and you'd be surprised how easy you could make someone press on a malicious link you know mm. and i keep doing it and i keep getting people and i keep training them but i keep doing it because you have to think like a hacker and you know and and that's what they do they're getting very creative these days and as you said, every time you introduce a new technology, or even if you patch, you don't patch up your your, your system, or or you make a change, then IT is always uh, being seen as as the entity that is the the entry point. I mean, if I'm a hacker, or what hackers come and do these days as red team tests, they first try to attack the IT, and they find out if an administrator has his passwords in a spreadsheet. <laughs> And, you know, to save them the hassle from going through firewalls and, and, and you know, all, all the other uh, security appliances. So IT need to be very, very um, uh, vigilant. And, you know, you know if, if, if you're saying, what is it? Practice what you preach, I think. You've got to practice what you preach to the end users. So, uh, again, in, in these times where there's a lot of pressure for securities and CISOs, you know, security officers, they're scratching their heads. I don't think they get enough sleep because they don't know if they're going to wake up the next day and find out if their system is still, you know, safe and sound or the data has been, you know, in the deep web somewhere. So right. security is another domain. It's it's a big area. But again, the more you introduce emerging technologies, the more you you've got areas of vulnerabilities that you're exposing yourself. Okay, and even as a the human being, okay, uh, uh, who to you know, people don't write their passwords on notes no you know hardly you know you tell them use a vault and why should i use a vault etc but the day you will lose your data or the day your iphone is damaged then then right yeah yeah absolutely that so, creates a, a risk there as well so i guess just to to bring this all full circle and, and wrap this all up and and um and maybe summarize what we've talked about here today what are some of the general recommendations that you have for an organization that is getting started 
on its digital transformation, particularly as it relates to business intelligence, data, security, and all the stuff we've talked about here so far today? What are some of those first steps that you would suggest to, to really get started on addressing this important topic? Oh, and we lost we lost you guess on right as I was asking the uh, the summary question here, or I I may have lost the feed here. Um, yep, we lost we lost Gasan there, so we'll we'll give him a second to come back to answer that question on um, the the uh, the the thing you can get started. But I think while we're waiting for Gasan to, to rejoin the link here or rejoin the stream, um, you know, one thing I want to come back to is the the um, the audit process that he he was talking about earlier. Um, I think just auditing your data and understanding what data you have in place and the, and the integrity of the data and really just understanding what you have to start with. I think that's one of the, the really important things that that's so important uh, in these sorts of uh, transformations. Um, and so that's that's one thing. And uh, the other thing is really um, to recognize it and to, to have a, a clear data migration strategy. So as part of your digital transformation uh, the overall plan. It's not just about deploying new technologies and new applications. You want to make sure that you have, um, make sure that you have a, a clear plan for how you're going to migrate data, how you're going to move it over to the new system, how you're going to cleanse it, what sort of master data management processes and governance you're going to put in place, how you're going to train your people during the transformation to ensure that they are able to preserve the integrity of the data and whatnot. So those are just a couple ways to get started um, on the, the data and BI um, and security campaign, if you will, or, or the strategy piece of it within a broader digital transformation. And again, oftentimes organizations don't think about this stuff until as they're getting into the transformation, until they're um, getting started on the transformation, or, or they get so focused on the technology that they don't they don't spend the time or take the time to get this stuff figured out on the on the data side of it, um, in the security side of it, in the BI side of it. And then I, another thing I would say is sort of a way to get started would be just to have a clear vision and a clear definition of how you want to get or, or how you want to use data. What sort of business intelligence do you expect to get out of the system? What do you want that end state to be? And sort of what what should those outputs be uh, from your digital transformation as it relates to business intelligence and analytics and data and all the stuff we're talking about here today? And then finally, you know, the last thing I'll throw in is just having a clear, you know, putting in a cybersecurity policy and security um expectations and in terms of training and how we're going to roll out these security uh, expectations to the organization, both from a technical perspective, but also from an organizational change perspective and a, and a process definition perspective. So in other words, I guess what I'm saying is all this data, uh, business intelligence, cybersecurity stuff that we're talking about has to be well integrated into the overall digital transformation strategy and plan too, to make sure that you're you're incorporating that and that the end result of what you get from your digital transformation is going to to address that. So I um, apologize that we lost Gassan. I, I suppose the good news is we had him here for 99% of the conversation, and then he, he just messaged me that he lost his connection. So we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up with him next time we, we have him on the show. And he's, he's a regular um, contributor to our weekly live streams. Uh, he's he's uh, regularly on here at, in the chats and asking great questions. So we'll, we'll see him again, and, and hopefully we'll have him on the show again as well. So I want to I want to uh, thank everyone for being here today and and, and uh, just as kind of a, a funny closing comment here, uh, Kyler on LinkedIn is blaming the hackers for the fact that uh, Gasan lost his connection and, and suddenly can't get on the internet. Uh, they must not have liked what he was saying, uh, call it calling their bluff there. So uh, thank you for adding some good humor to a a, a a common situation that we too commonly see today, which is uh, just something simple like a, an internet connection sometimes can be can be challenging uh, in any situation. So. Uh, thank you, Gasan, for being here. He's actually, he actually can hear us, which is funny. So he's listening in and can hear us, but he just can't seem to get on the uh, the video portion of the, the conversation here. So thank you for being here today, Gasan. Really appreciate you, you joining. Um, thank you to the audience for being here today as well. Um, again, this conversation will be part of the uh, Transformation Ground Control podcast episode that gets released tomorrow or a week from tomorrow. And that podcast is released every Wednesday on all the audio podcast platforms throughout the world, as well as LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So we stream those every Wednesday. Um, so be sure to check next Wednesday's episode. And of course, we'll have another episode that comes out tomorrow um, from content we've already produced and it's ready to go. So we hope you'll check out the uh, the ongoing weekly Transformation Ground Control podcast. And again, we do these live streams every Tuesday, same time, same place 
as part of our production of the Transformation Ground Control Podcast. So thank you for being here today. Really appreciate it. And um, we look forward to seeing you next time. For those of you in the United States, hope you have a great holiday week, um, which is where I'm at. I'm here in the United States. So I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving for those of you in the United States and happy World Cup viewing for those of you that are enjoying the World Cup and have a great rest of your week wherever you're joining from today. Thank you again for being here and we'll see you next time on the Digital Transformation on the Digital Transformation live stream. Have a great week and we will see you all next time. Take care.